Hello and welcome back to the Bandofla episode. I'm delighted to be joined by some very uh, good friends of Bandofla. Both of these guests have previously been on our show talking on, on various subjects. Um, on the top left of your program, of the screen that you're watching, I've got Dr. Errol Kaimak. Errol is a professor of international relations at the Eastern Mediterranean University, and he's also a former advisor to the president's office. And on the row beneath us is Baroness uh, Meral Hussein Ece. Uh, Meral is the only Turkish Cypriot to, to have been uh, to have made it into the corridors of democracy in in UK Parliament. Um, both of you very welcome to to the show. Okay, we're we're, we're going to be talking about the elections back home in in North Cyprus. Um, they took place last weekend. Uh, it is still kind of a little bit up in the air in terms of where we are at the moment. Um, Errol, if I could just start with you in terms of, I'll come to you as well, Meral, in terms of any initial reactions. Yes, um, on the result last Sunday. But Errol, if I can have your initial reactions to, to where, where things stand at the moment. Well, it's a bit underwhelming, isn't it? We, we don't see a major uh, change. Uh, what we see is a potential consolidation uh, of the government, um, the government led by the National Unity Party uh, had a bit of a problem in recent months uh, with the pandemic and uh, with coalition relations. Uh, but as you can see, the, the leading party of that coalition, the National Unity Party, increased its number of seats in the parliament uh, in line with its slogan that it wanted more stability in parliament. And uh, I think it got the result it wants, of course, with the small caveat that uh, the National Unity Party still needs to uh, establish a coalition government. So at the present time, we're talking about negotiations underway to reestablish a coalition government, similar to the one uh, that existed prior to the election. So really at the end of the day, uh, as far as the politics is concerned, not much will change. Okay, thanks, uh, Errol. Uh, Merah, I don't know what your initial thoughts are, your reactions to, to, to the current position back home? Um, yeah, well, it doesn't seem like, uh, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Errol there. It's very, seems to be quite underwhelming. Um, and I was concerned about the campaign to boycott the elections. I'm always concerned about that because I always think that really is not the way to do things, is to ignore democratic, you know, the ballot box. Uh, that's the only way people can express their views and, and you know, and bring about change they want it so I think just a preliminary I haven't looked at it in, in uh, or analyzed the results very closely but from you know initial just looking at the at the figures it seems to me the smaller parties on the sort of sort of more liberal center seem to have suffered as a result of that I don't know if that's you know they're the their supporters stayed at home um or you know um generally I mean the, the turnout didn't seem to be too low but generally I think those smaller parties seem to have suffered more um, having said that, the CTP I just see went up to just under 32%, which is an, an, an MPs from 12 to 18, um, which, which is obviously a sizable difference. Disappointingly, it was uh, is Kudret's, Azersoy's party, um, who have lost quite a number of MPs. So obviously that is disappointing. My overall um, view on this is that, I mean, for a country the size of, I don't know, what is the electorate there? 400,000, what is it? it? I mean, we so many parties, you know, um, and the vote is skewed in all different directions. So very little change in the ruling party and the pro, um, you know, the pro-establishment, but um, it's disappointing that um, it seems to me that um, parties have got very little, I mean, some of them, I just can't see what the difference is between their political perspective is at all. So, you know, it just seems to me this is, but we're going to constantly see this, this sort of splitting of votes and not one party finding it very difficult or, or even a group coming together uh, to consolidate their position. So nothing new. I didn't see nothing new, anything new that was being proposed by the, um, the uh, 
party that won, the ruling party, I haven't seen anything new other than just sustain the status quo, which I think is disappointing. I, I do feel that, you know, in Cyprus, North Cyprus, Turkey, Cypriots are crying out for some radical changes to improve, not just on the Cyprus issue, but, you know, in, every, on their, in their lives, on their everyday lives, they do want to see some radical change. And I don't see much evidence that that's going to happen uh, as a result of these elections. So, yeah, uh, just more more of the usual, I should think. What what type of radical change would you like to see come into play? Well, you know, I'd like to see some of the institutions that are already there um, strengthened. Um, I haven't been for a few years, I have to say, because of the pandemic. I haven't been for over three years, but I do feel that, you know, local authorities, local councils, municipalities need to um, perhaps be given more autonomy and, um, you know, powers to sort of, you know, start to really make a difference in their neighbourhoods. I constantly see on social media and talking to relatives how they're fed up with, you know, nothing's been done about the environment, nothing's been done about, you know, um, sort of social care or health systems or, you know, I think just generally um, aspects that are the local authority responsibility don't seem to be getting as much attention. All the attention and all the power seems to be concentrated um, in a governmental level rather than being more, um, you know, um, more, more powers really, I suppose, and more responsibility at municipality level. I know there's a financial issue always, financial problems, um, but I, I, I do feel that, and I just do feel there should be more in ways of civil society, educating civil society, young people about how important it is to to um, strengthen these institutions um, in order that they can, at the end of the day, all politicians should be serving the public, not serving a political party particularly, but they should be serving the public. Yeah, I, I, I agree, um, Meryl Hanum. I mean, Errol, in terms of, Meryl commented there in terms of the uh, underperformance, if you like, of uh, a couple of the parties. Um, Mustafa Akinj's party didn't meet the parliamentary, parliamentary threshold. Um, and yeah. didn't haven't registered any MPs at all. And uh, Kudret's party unfortunately lost um, some seats. I think they've only uh, managed to get two MPs into Parliament. Um, what's your thoughts around how tenable their positions are as as leader of of their respective parties? They're both obviously very uh, both very respected individuals. I know that there's a lot of Turkey Cypriots here in the UK who hold them in very high regard. Um, but given the performances of their party, what do you think should be their next steps? Good. I, I, I share your frustration that progressive forces in Turkey Cypriot politics have not been making headway electorally, right? I mean, that was the thrust of Meral Hanum's comments a moment ago. Um, just a couple of corrections. First of all, with respect to uh, Halkan Party, your People's Party, what you refer to mm -hmm. as Kudret Party, um, they had three. Okay, apologies. Sorry. And, uh, and the, the second correction is that uh, the Tetepe, I think you're referring to, is not Akunja's party, right? Uh, uh, Mr. Akunja is not active. In fact, th that may have been a factor in the election. Uh, he, mm -hmm is omission, if you will, right? So, um, so in the center left and left, there, there seems to be splintering among a number of groups. Uh, and no leader has been able to fill Mustafa Akinj's shoes, so to speak. Um, of course, there are other factors as well, but a lack of organization there, as well as the boycott uh, that uh, was mentioned a few moments ago may have played a role uh, there. Uh, but with respect to the center right, if you will, and that's how I'm going to characterize Kudret uh, Özesay and the party, um, there's also a lack of confidence uh, in that movement. You'll recall that uh, uh, when Mr. Özesay first set up the party, and prior to that, uh, when he first engaged as a civil society uh, activist, there was a lot of hope that we could do a lot of the things that Meral Hanım mentioned a few moments ago, that is strengthen civil society, and create a more participatory democratic mm. polity and demos, if those are the right words to use. I don't know, maybe academic. Um, but for a number of reasons, um, that legacy hasn't carried on, right? Um, there's a lot of 
there's a lack of confidence uh, in the party. And uh, that's a question that he would have to answer along with the members of the party to sort out because um, it's, it's obvious that uh, the, the, um, the coalition first established the, the four-way coalition after the election in 2018 uh, fell apart. Uh, we don't understand exactly the reasons for that, although it's been explained. And then he said he set up a coalition government with the ruling National Unity Party, which also came apart, right? So there's not much to show uh, for the effort uh, in terms of a reform-based movement. As far as Mr. Akunji is concerned, you know that he's persona non grata, virtually speaking, in Turkey. And you can see that all of the parties that took a strong stance against Turkish interference in Turkish Cypriot affairs have been penalized, right? Uh, the Republican Turkish party headed by Tufan Erhurman took a much more moderate stance. In fact, they didn't want, want to discuss the Cyprus problem at all. And, uh, and uh, maybe that moderate stance paid off for them. Interesting, uh, apologies about my uh, Mustafa Akinji point. This is the perception of people here in the UK still. Um, thank you for correcting uh, us on that at all. So what do you think will be the main priorities for the, the new government um, in, the, in the TRNC? Well, the, the, there, there are a number of problems uh, stemming from the, the economic crisis and the pandemic. And I think that those are uh, at the center of things. Uh, because the Cyprus problem is secondary, that is, it, it's something uh, uh, administered through the presidential office, uh, it's not really on the agenda uh, of mm -hmm. the government. Although um, this government will be working in tandem uh, with President Tatar uh, in support, in full support of Tatar's uh, presidential efforts uh, on the Cyprus problem, uh, which of course means no to federation, and yes to cooperation on the basis of two existing states, uh, uh, whether that's accepted internationally or not. So I anticipate that the, the, the big problem will be economic, right? Followed by the Cyprus problem. Okay. And not to mention the pandemic. Yeah. Meral, do you think there's any, any other um, priorities or challenges that, that will immediately face the new government? Uh, well, I, I, I agree with uh, Errol Ray on this. Uh, the economy is obviously um, a massive problem. Um, and, um, well, it's a, just a, a statement of fact that because um, the Cyprus economy, North Cyprus economy is tied so closely to Turkey's economy and the economy there has suffered so badly in the last year, certainly with the, um, um, you know, the cost of living and the and, and inflation rates, um, and I've, you know, I don't think many people in living memory remember the Turkish lira being so low, falling so low. And people in Turkey, and certainly people I talk to, I have family there and friends there, are really suffering. People are really suffering. Um, and of course, it's going to reflect, you know, when Turkey sneezes, North Cyprus catches the cold. And I'm, I'm afraid it's such a, you know, as I said, it's a small, a small place, heavily reliant on Turkey. Um, subject to um, embargoes and, you know, um, not able to stand on its own two feet or export in any shape or form or raise funds through financial markets, um, it will carry on suffering until such time that the um, situation changes in Turkey or some other agreements are put in place, which is, is not likely to happen. Um, I think the Cyprus issue is secondary. I think um, uh, the UN is sort of more or less shrugging its shoulders and saying there's nothing more we can do so um you know the constant talking about two-state solution is it's like talking to an echo chamber no one else is listening no one's interested in that it's not going to happen as far as i can tell certainly in our i think in our lifetimes so we're just back to i think i think i've said this before when i've been over the years that you know it's in we there are democratic elections being held regardless of in, in the north regardless of whether anyone outside Turkey recognizes that. And it's important that those politicians and those people in, in charge who have that mandate to do what they can to improve the, the lives of the Turkish Cypriots living in North Cyprus. So if that's the economy, you know, they've got to try and secure by any means possible, trying to ensure that Turkish Cypriots 
those vulnerable, particularly those who are more vulnerable, um, are looked after. And, and the other things I've mentioned as well, I know young people are concerned about um, the, the, the future, you know, their future. I mean, they, many of them graduate from university with very good, um, very good degrees, very good education, but where do they go? Sadly, they leave um, because for the, of the lack of um, uh, employment opportunities and prospects. And that's always been a great sadness that Turkish Cypriots have been diminished over the years, um, simply because they, you know, if they want a future and to be part of the wider world now, be connected to the global world, um, it's very difficult to sustain that if you live in North Cyprus. Um, so, you know, it is bleak. I don't, I don't want to come across as, you know, there's no hope, but I do feel... You know, the elections have, you know, it seems it's gone down, the number of people participating was about 57%, which is not very much, is it, for a general, for a parliamentary elections. Um, there was this boycott, which I don't understand what, what that boycott was meant to achieve. Um, it's, it's crazy. I've never known a situation in any country that political parties say, let's boycott elections. I mean, you know, staying at home and not using the ballot box is... It's crazy. It doesn't achieve anything other than usually uh, that you know, people that you might want to support or changes you are, might want to make are not going to happen. You end up with, you know, the status quo, probably, um, which would certainly happen in most countries if people didn't bother to vote. So I, I think the situation is rather bleak. I don't see um, a, a lot happening at the moment. Um, and for those who and I know the president Tatar is, you know, stood on a platform of um, a two-state two solution. I don't know who's going to ever sit down internationally and negotiate that, and when, when that will ever happen. So I think it's actually promising um, a scenario or promising an end game that um, is virtually impossible to achieve. In the meantime, you know, people are getting on with their lives. People are, you know, as I said, people you know they want a life they want a future they want prosperity you know and i can't see how that's going to happen um for a lot of people who are you know not in a very privileged position i know people who've lost their jobs and have got little prospect of getting new jobs even though the lucky ones who had jobs have lost their jobs so uh, the economy has got to be the, the front and center of any recovery of any politician and i just hope all the mps that have got elected will start coming together and working together instead of this sort of tribal factionalism that we see so much in, in Cyprus, uh, in the communities as well as in Parliament, that they need to start coming together for the greater good um, to, to, to try and put in place some measures to support the community. It is very frustrating, and I, I share that frustration, uh, Meral Hanum. I mean, where, where, do, where, where does the collective turn? And I, I'll, I'll answer you, Erol. You know, we've seen the Anand plan where there was a leap of faith by Turkish Cypriots um, voting favourably in the referendum. Um, and unfortunately, the Cypriot neighbours um, cast ohi um, and, you know, it didn't go anywhere. There's promises from the international community. Um, as Mera Halem says, there's talk of two state solution, but the international community doesn't have any interest, or there's no indications that they have any interest on that. I don't know whether the, the, the gas situation in the sea might influence that either way. Um, where can or where should Turkish Cypriots turn now? Do, do they simply cement their ties with Turkey even more or do they try to go in a more kind of pro-federal direction? What's the options? Well, I... I I think you've answered your own question, right? These are not proper questions to ask the Turkey Cypriot people because no one's providing the answers. Uh, as you just highlighted, in 2004, the Turkey Cypriots did vote in favor of a plan to reunite the island in time for EU accession. And so the Turkish side, or at least the Turkey Cypriot electorate, did its bid, um, but it was left at the altar, so to speak, right? And uh, and we saw the Greek Cypriots run off uh, with the EU, uh, if I you know, carry on with the infidelity analogy, right? And, um, and so you can imagine that Turkey Cypriots are jaded to some extent and also deflated and demoralized. Uh, and, uh, and so really, um, you know, just to come back to that issue of, of the boycott, right? You can see that that also then manifests itself 
in a lot of people just tuning out, uh, not really having um, a stake in the electoral process because they really don't think that anything that they do will lead to a strategic change of direction. Um, right now, as we speak, the United Nations is engaging uh, with the sides on a series of CVMs or confidence building measures, um, one of which includes um, at the high level, uh, an exchange of Marash, what Greek Cypriots call Varosha for Erjan. Um, so that's the big ticket item. But I'm concerned that even these big items which could lend to economic revival will just fizzle away because of the geopolitical um, sentiment of the time. In other words, as we speak, um, there's too much going on, whether it be Ukraine, uh, whether it be the Western Alliance coming together or not, uh, whether it be where Turkey is within uh, that frame, that the Turkish Cypriot voice cannot really be heard. Um, the only way the Turkish Cypriots are therefore represented are through the Cyprus problem. And right now the Cyprus problem means no autonomy. It means aligning ourselves with Turkey's geopolitical situation. And that means that we cannot really make any progress on Cyprus until at least 2023, uh, when uh, President Erdogan will bid to get reelected. So this, I think, is a dilemma for all of us because you know we're told that we should reflect our will at the ballot box, I think, as Med al Hanum accurately put it. But at the same time, um, I'd just like to point out that maybe Turkish Cypriots are not alone to blame in these outcomes because we really have been left out in the cold, quite literally. And many Turkish Cypriots, therefore, as Med al Hanum were pointing out, are, are, are uh, leaving, right? So expatriates now, yourselves, right? Uh, people who live in the UK are increasingly becoming the norm. One of the byproducts of the 2004 uh, uh, um, accession of Cyprus into the EU is that Turkish Cypriots have attained uh, EU uh, uh, passports. And of course, now uh, they can leave the island uh, when we have these economic crises. So we've had, we've had a series of these in our history, right? If you think of, of it, uh, when uh, Britain uh, took over um, and uh, pronounced Cyprus a crown colony, many Ottoman Turks at the time uh, found themselves leaving. Uh, and then in the 1950s, uh, uh, when it came time for the British to relinquish power to the Republic of Cyprus, similarly, uh, many people left the island, right? And now we see a pattern of this recurring whenever there's an interregnum or a time of change and, and uh, economic crisis, we see people <coughs> leaving. And so I'm really concerned um, that the Turkish Cypriot community as a political community will be eroded this time. In other words, um, I, I know that's a radical position to take, you know, because uh, the TRNC represents the Turkish Cypriots, but increasingly it seems to be that Turkish Cypriots will become a demographic minority in this process and their will will no longer be reflected through the ballot box. And then what have you got, right? You have expatriates and that's it. So uh, that's really the end game that I'm really concerned about. And uh, if I've ever said, uh, supported a settlement in Cyprus, it was for that reason not because I really thought that we were going to get along with Greek Cypriots, but, you know, or that there'd be no problems uh, with the European Union, because, you know, we could have a whole discussion about Brexit and whatnot, you know, and, <laughs> and you know, we could, you know, we could discuss all of these issues, but that's not, that's not what, what we're here to discuss. The question is, what are the options uh, before the Turkey Cypriots? What sort of strategic decisions can they make? Yeah, I think the B word is a bit of a swear word for, for me and Meral Hanum, uh, Meral. Um, right, uh, Meral, did you want to uh, add anything on to those points? Well, can I just sort of, um, you know, I've been reading reports that the boycott campaign is now sort of congratulating itself on, you know, the raised level of, of abstentions. Um, I mean, I, I just don't know what abstention was meant to ever achieve you know as, as a sort of as a strategy 
as a campaign. I mean, you know, it's never a good thing in democracy. It's never a victory to have abstentions uh, in, an, in an election. I mean, we, I spent most of my political career encouraging people in my community to vote in this country in local elections and general elections in order to be relevant and in order that they, you know, that they're, that, you know, their views are, are taken seriously. I mean, I think no political party at all, um, certainly you'll know this as, uh, as well, Fezzi, as, a, as an activist in this country. I mean, people who do vote are the ones who are taken seriously. You know, political parties know their demo demographics. They know who votes. Um, yeah. So some communities are very good at voting. Like for example, in this country now, there's, you know, the growing sort of African communities and Indian communities, they really turn out and vote. Well, sadly, our community had a very bad record. Turkish Cypriot community had a very bad record of voting. I remember when I first stood in the early 90s in local uh, elections, uh, I was canvassing Turkish Cypriots who were concentrated in the, the, the London boroughs where I stood, who had never voted. They'd been in this country 30 years, they'd never bothered to vote. And I was, you know, the campaign we started here is if you don't vote, you don't count. So you know, what kind of, I don't know, what sort of logic was being used, what intelligence was being used to apply this. Um, and going back to uh, talking about, you know, Turkish Cypriots as a um, and, and the demographics. I, I mean, I've been saying this for some years, probably over a decade now, my big concern um, is the fact, and I've said this to Greek Cypriots who are so worried about Turkey, who keep on and on about Turkey, they're obsessed with Turkey. And I say to them, and I've even said it to the, the Greek Cypriot president when I met him um, briefly uh, some a few years ago, and I've said to him that you keep complaining about Turkey. What you're doing, in fact, is damaging, what you're doing is actually reducing the number of Cypriots, Turkish Cypriots on the island. You're going to have to deal with Turkey more and more uh, along your border. Um, they don't seem to understand that they're, you know, setting their face against any certainly not just the Annan plan, but in the Crans Montana in 2017, the way that the president then walked out, uh, you know, which astonished everybody present. They, I mean, it shocked everyone, you, from the UN Secretary General down, they couldn't believe that this had happened, um, that he'd walked out when, you know, he, he clearly would have been a great breakthrough for and, and everyone on the table. Turkey was committed, everyone was committed. The fact he walked out of those talks, um, and then went away to complain about it was all Turkey's fault. Well, nobody buys that anymore. Um, so I, the Great Cypriots have to take a lot of responsibility, in my view, for not bothering, not taking these talks seriously when there were some big opportunities to bring the, um, bring the country together uh, as part of the EU, so that North would be part. Technically, the whole of Cyprus is in, is in the EU, but of course, the, it's suspended in the North. I did notice that the... Um, uh, CH, uh, CTP, had, one of their policies was actually to work towards introducing the euro in the north. Um, I don't know if that was discussed. I don't know what uh, Errol B might have to say about that. I'd only read about it a few days ago, which I thought was an interesting policy um, because he, you know, obviously the euro is doing very well. Mm. We certainly know this now because <laughs> as Britain is outside the EU, we're suffering our own eco economic problems uh, post-Brexit. But unless there's some radical changes, um, I feel that North Cyprus has become more and more isolated. The political parties have become more and more inward looking and isolated. And the community, therefore, is suffering. Sadly, you know, I really would like to be upbeat. I really would like, I'm an optimistic person. I always like to try and look on, on positive policies, but I can't see a way out of this on pass. On pass. All I see is a, a deadlock and um, the status quo just continuing. Um, I'll just touch on what uh, Erobe said about Varosha and uh, the uh, Erjan. I understand that was offered during um, recent talks uh, that, that were abandoned. Um, this was put on the table, I understand, and rejected. I don't know quite, you know, that's not been probably, probably explored further, but um, uh, I do feel that when things are put on the table, they should be explored a bit more rather than just rejected out of hand. Because um, if Erdogan had become recognised as an international airport, it would have made a lot of difference. But then, uh, you know, it's not as simple as that. But I, I'm, I, I feel disappointed and depressed that, you know, Turkish Cypriots, people from my community are facing such hardship.
and it's and I can tell you now is in British politics it's nowhere on the agenda nowhere that's um I, I mean hopefully you know there's going to be some political players who who will be watching this discussion and and it will provide some food for thought in terms of you know so if, if anything you know bringing focus to to the issue of of the cyprus problem I, I think you are absolutely spot on in terms of the radar this where the cyprus problem is as far away as it can be mm. in terms of the the foreign office here in the uk i don't know where it sits in the EU's radar as well. It, it, you know, it's but there's too many problems. Uh, Errol alluded to the U Ukraine issue as well. Um, there are far too many problems, sadly, um, for Cyprus to to come onto people's radar. So it has been a bit of a gloomy interview, <laughs> but that, that's the reality, unfortunately. And it's yeah. no it's no use us looking through rose-tinted spectacles and saying that, you know, towing a line which simply isn't true. Um, but I do want to finish on what I believe is a more positive note. And I know this is a, a subject that you both feel uh, passionately about. Certainly, I know, Meryl, with your equalities hat on. The whole issue around um, gender representation in uh, mm. the you know, Cyprus in the TRNC Parliament, and I know me and Errol touched on this when we did a, a, a chat on on the last presidential election, um, and I commented how poor uh, there was no candidates and that who, who were women standing in the president's election at the time. But 131 women stood in the elections last week, and there are now 11 MPs. Um, who are women, which represents a, um, a a marked improvement. Errol, what do you why do you think that that that's do you think there's a reason why there's been a positive change in terms of gender representation? Or do you do you think they've taken it on board? Or, you know what's what's been the driving motivation behind that? Well, I think it is true that um, some parties are more committed to gender representation than previously had been the case. There's also been some. Uh, legislative moves in that direction. But I think that the real reason why you had 11, and, and for your listeners, 11 out of 50, I think is 22%, um, uh, has to do with the profile of the candidates and where they're put on the party list. You know, when we, we um, uh, you can, in Turkey Cypriot politics, stamp for your party, in which case it's in rank order, and you can choose within. But uh, always you have the advantage of being ranked high. So uh, coming back to, uh, we were talking about Akurda Özarsay, right? Uh, in his party, uh, two MPs uh, out of the three uh, are women. So there you have a, a high percentage, right? Uh, and it's, it's no surprise that the two who won are relatively high profile individuals. One is a former uh, minister, right? Minister of Interior. Uh, and the other is a very uh, high profile uh, MP uh, who's uh, uh, very vocal on issues like the pandemic and health issues because uh, that, that's her career background in uh, biomedical uh, industry. Um, so uh, I think the quality of candidates matters quite a bit. And, I, and I'm quite optimistic for the future to the extent that Turkish Cypriots are a secular society. I don't mean that just in a religious sense, but also meritocratic at core, right? Um, if we have high quality uh, woman candidates and uh, if they're recognized by political parties as such, uh, I th and given the opportunity, uh, I think that the, the future bodes well. Uh, so um, maybe I'm too optimistic or maybe I'm counterbalancing the pessimism that we've been expressing for the past half hour or so. Uh, but, uh, but yes, it's a glimmer of hope. Meral Hanem, any uh, thoughts around the, the progress on gender representation in, in the um, uh, Turkish Cypriot Parliament? Well, well, I'll try and be optimistic because I think I've been very gloomy. Um, I've been critical of the fact that um, Cyprus, North and South, has been a sort of, you know, um, has not been a very welcoming place for women and, and a very poor representation. I think it's, a, I don't know if it's a Cyprus problem generally, but certainly 11 MPs, 
it's good. I mean, I'm really pleased they've been elected and, and, and I know a few of them as well, uh, who are very good, very able women, but it's still too low, isn't it? I mean, 11 out of, what is that, about 20%? I'm not sure what the yeah, total 22%. number is. 22% is still pathetic and not at all reflective of a population of 50, 51% um, are women. Um, and I do think that is a problem until you get proper representation of women uh, in, in, every, in every area. I mean, Cyprus never had a female president. Um, why not? You know, Turkey had a female president back in the 90s. Why, why you know, why not? Um, I think it's a real problem. I'm glad more women are coming forward. I think that's showing uh, that women are generally more, um, uh, well, maybe they're fed up with the way that things have been run by men uh, uh, and the male kind of establishment has let them down, has not um, exactly been uh, helpful to women's causes. Um, you, you can't make laws, legislation and an environment and, you know, a, a country represented, rep representative um, on issues that matter to women and men uh, if you've got no representation. I mean, I know this because if you don't have women at the table making decisions, where the money is spent, where decisions are taken, they're not going to be skewed towards helping women and helping families and uh, so, so on. So I think there probably now is a, a bit of a sea change if more women are coming forward. However, the top echelons, and, and I, I know from um, what Elbe said, and, and unless you get women in those top ranking positions, um, they're not going to get elected. I mean, it's all very well saying there are 100, what was it, 118, you said? Was 131. 131. 131, but where were they ranked? Mm. In those political parties, I would like to see the analysis of where they were actually ranked. If they were, you know, at the bottom of the list, what's the point? They're just there for, as we would say, window dressing and nothing else. So I, th I think we get, and I'm very critical of Cypriot politics on all, all right. I mean, the Republic, the Greek Cypriots are just as bad. I mean, I think they've actually gone down in representation as well. You know, they had women in um, ministerial positions in the past. I, I think there's only one now, one or two. So it's just as bad there. But I, I, I'm kind of, um, I'm still a bit cynical um, about the fact that uh, will the men in power give way, make way? For women, I think in, in I work, I've worked internationally with many other countries, and um, certainly in Swedish countries, European countries, they have a quota. So um, even in Pakistan, even in the Sudan, would you believe where, where I've been, they have a quota of a third of parliamentarians must be women. So there has to be a threshold, and I think they should do that. Why don't they introduce that in North Cyprus? It's very easily done. Um, make sure that all MPs, a third of them at least, must be women. And after a while, in some countries like Sweden and I think it's Norway and others, because they've met that threshold, it, they don't need to apply it anymore because it's become part of their, you know, part of their democracy. That there has to be a represent, a, 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 you know, a third of a, at least a third, if not more, of women. And, and certainly, those countries have seen an increase um, uh, in women MPs, uh, as well as uh, prime minister. At the prime minister level, They've, many of them have got now got female prime ministers, uh, and I think it's good for a democracy to have that change, not to have that sort of male dominance, um, you know, in, in a democracy. So yeah, I I, I would want to see that, I, um, you know, I'd like to see the constitution change to reflect that. Given there's been such little progress at this rate, it would take probably another hundred years to get to fifty percent, which is not acceptable. Yeah, I think you're being a bit optimistic with the hundred years uh, guess there. <laughs> but I, th I think in all seriousness um you know if you know we i work in a trade union you work in british politics we're aware of innovative programs that are very engaging and, and empower women and give them the tools the skills and the confidence um to engage in public life and you know hopefully people listening to this will be able to you know have a think about that and i know you'd be willing to offer your your expertise and, and input if, if they wanted to well absolutely uh, just to add actually that i'm very pleased that my own party has now got more female has more female mps than men which is quite a, <laughs> it's quite something quite an achievement but in british politics is just as bad uh, let's be honest i mean there's been huge efforts by all political parties to increase uh representation of women and it's crept up in the uh common house of commons it has crept up i think it's high now it's quite high now but in the house of lords of course which is where i sit 
uh, we're only on about 20, I think it's about 26% uh, women. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of used to always being the minority everywhere, but so I feel that I can um, hold these views because I, I can see the difference it can make when more women are, you know, when I see the women um, that I work with across parliament, they certainly punch above their weight. Okay. Because they're in the minority. Yeah. Okay, we've come to the end of the this uh, interview. I really appreciate you both being here. Have you, I mean, any final thoughts, uh, Errol, that you'd like to uh, part uh, with from our audience? No, I was just reflecting that 22% is not too far off of 26% in the House of Lords. So, <laughs> so yeah. No, no, no. We're, no, not, elected. we're not elected. We're not elected. That's half full. We're not elected. Yeah. Are there any final thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, I, you know, I, I still think, you know, uh, Turkish Cypriots are very resilient. Um, they've had to be, you know, our families, our communities have had to be resilient over the years because of the, you know, the hardships that they've had to face, the isolation, non-recognition, um, and, you know, the sort of restriction of movement and and opportunities in the wider world and now we're in a global world now and it's it, it really makes me very sad that young people just aren't part of that unless they leave their country um and that shouldn't have to be so i mean but i remain optimistic that things can change in the future um it's a question of galvanizing and um you know trying to get more younger people uh and, and i think what um, Errol Bay said this it's very a better not better, I don't want to say better quality, but, you know, more sort of people that are, um, you know, very committed, very much committed, rather than want to be just a sort of career politician, but people that really want to get elected in order to bring about change, who've got ideas, who've got passion, who've got a commitment to do good. Um, and these are the sort of people that, you know, that should be encouraged and supported to, to stand, you know, in these elections in the future. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Erol Kaimak, uh, Baroness Meral Hussein Eje. Thank you for your time. Um, for people Thank listening on, on the podcast, we'll be back shortly with the final segment of the show. Uh, this particular session will be shared on YouTube very shortly. So thank you all for, for tuning in.